Coming up, the ACC is preparing comments to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services about its proposed 2012 Medicare Physician Fee Schedule. Find out what issues could impact cardiology practices. And the college opens its doors to new members. What fields qualify for the ACC's newest membership designation? And finally, we'll sit down with ACC President David Holmes. He'll talk with us about appropriate use criteria concerning PCI and how the NCDR might shed insights on how to improve performance. Stay with us. Welcome to this edition of the ACC Update for August. I'm Lisa Fletcher. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services is accepting public comments on its proposed 2012 Medicare Physician Fee Schedule. This rule sets payments for all physician services and associated policies for the next year. Overall, the rule does not include any major cuts for cardiovascular services. However, cardiology will continue to see a decrease in overall physician payment due to the third year phase in of the practice expense cuts. Other important CMS proposals include reducing payments by 50% for the professional component of certain imaging services provided at the same session by the same physician, new requirements for the federal e-prescribing incentive program and the physician quality reporting system, value-based purchasing, physician compare, and potentially misvalued services. The ACC is submitting formal comments this month more detailed information is available on cardiosource.org under advocacy. Physicians can now gain access to the popular live program, Recent Advances in Clinical Nuclear Cardiology and Cardiac CT, with the ACC's most recent Meeting on Demand. The MOD program surveys the various imaging modalities and cutting edge technologies and offers healthcare professionals the opportunity to listen to lectures from leading experts. Key program topics include advances in cardiac spect and PET, new approaches for pharmacologic stress testing, recent evidence about clinical applications of cardiac CT, future of cardiac CT and cardiac magnetic imaging, and appropriate use criteria's impact on clinical practice. For more information, visit cardiosource.org slash nuclear cardiology CT. Cardiovascular technologists, including sonographers, electrophysiology specialists, invasive specialists, and vascular specialists, can now become members of the ACC. In June, the college opened its doors to a new membership category, Cardiovascular Technologists Partners in Care, or PIC. PIC members must be certified by Cardiovascular Credentialing International and have two or more years of experience in their field. PIC members receive special benefits, including complimentary access to ACC publications, discounts on ACC educational programs and products, and leadership and networking opportunities through the Cardiovascular Care Team Council and section. More information is available via cardiosource.org slash PIC. In response to feedback from members, the college has implemented a new and improved search function on cardiosource.org that quickly and intelligently searches content. The search tool includes such features as relevant guidelines and consensus documents identification, auto spell check, and expanded searchability by source, learning pathway, or related themes. The next phase of the project will focus on establishing point-of-care tools with a particular emphasis on quickly finding answers to clinical questions from ACC's storehouse of trusted clinical documents. Stay tuned for more exciting changes to Cardiosource.org. We'll be back after this short break. Stay with us. Attend the 44th Annual New York Cardiovascular Symposium. Major topics in cardiology today, December 9th through 11th, 2011. Don't miss this significant and highly rated event. Register today at cardiosource.org slash NYCV Symposium. 
recent study based on NCDR data published in the Journal of the American Medical Association shows that while the majority of patients are appropriately selected for percutaneous coronary intervention or PCI procedures, there's still room for improvement, especially in the non-emergency setting. Joining me to talk more about the appropriateness of percutaneous coronary intervention study is ACC President Dr. David Holmes. Dr. Holmes, thanks for being here. It's great to be here. So uh, tell me, what does appropriate use mean? Does it mean something should be done, something shouldn't be done, don't have a clue? Sure, it's a great question. So it's a technology, it's a methodology that makes sense. If you were to say to somebody, we can do something, that is very different than we should do something. And so appropriate use criteria have been developed and then applied in the cardiovascular arena to identify three broad groups of indications. These broad groups can be generally termed as a group of indications where everybody would agree should be done. Not only can it be done, but it should be done. There would be a group of indications that are termed inappropriate. Now, an inappropriate indication would be outside of the usual guidelines. For example, if you are seeing a patient and the guideline recommended therapy says you shouldn't do something, mm -hmm. and the patient says, I understand all of that, but I think that I'd like to have that done. Then you have to decide that interaction between physician and patient, how that works so that you have explained the risks and the benefits to the patient and the family. And then the patient then says, I have reviewed the risks and the benefits, and I think that indeed this would be a good procedure for me, or it's not going to be a good procedure for me. And then there's a middle group that says, we're not sure we don't have the evidence-based medicine to tell whether something should be done, that could be done, or whether something shouldn't be done, that also could be done. So how do you specifically apply this then to cardiovascular sure. disease? It's a great question. We know in cardiovascular disease that there is a broad array of diagnostic tests, such as imaging tests. There's a broad array of therapeutic and treatment strategies in terms of implementation of, for example, here, revascularization protocols. So what you do is to take a large data set or a small data set, it doesn't matter, that looks at a group of patients who are treated with a specific procedure. And then retrospectively, after they have been treated with that specific procedure, try to decide, did they fit the guideline-based data? And so was the decision a good one to do, or was it something that you're not sure about, or was it something that you need more information about? And so this very important information that came out of the NCDR, PCI registry, addressed that. Looked at a large number of patients, about 500,000 patients. Mm -hmm. So a very large group of patients. So that study comes in the wake of controversy that stents may be being overused. Is there a way that this study can help with quality improvement? Absolutely. The first thing that we need to make sure about when we talk about quality improvement, we need to make sure that we have a good handle for what is being done terribly important. Yeah. So in this series, we can see that patients who come in acutely ill, they receive procedures because somebody says, They're, you're acutely ill, we need to do them. And in this group of patients in whom they're acutely ill, the procedures that are performed are typically felt to be, boy, you got to do something. And so that's a group of patients in whom it's not very common that you make what are considered to be inappropriate recommendations of care. Where it comes to be more problem, more problematic, would be the group of patients who would come in who aren't critically ill. Mm -hmm. And that is the group of lower risk patients, and that happen to be 30% in this experience. So you then use the same metrics in this group of patients to say in this patient who is not acutely ill, is a procedure that is then performed, would everybody look at it and say, makes sense? You would then say, in this group of patients, in the majority of patients, indeed, either the procedure made sense or somebody said, well, it could, could go either way. We don't have the evidence one way or the other. The focus of this and the concern has been there have been about 12% of patients, as you have suggested, in whom looking back at the procedure which was performed, somebody said, gee, I'm not so sure. 
And so it's then categorized as inappropriate. Now, within that inappropriate classification, there was wide variability. In some of the hospitals, there wasn't very much variability. Some hospitals, there was a lot of variability. And so having identified that, having measured that, then you can study it. So this is a very important document that is a snapshot of what is being done. The most important document then is the next one that says, in those patients who were labeled, quote unquote, inappropriate, why is that? Is that because after talking with the patient, the physician said, gee, this is a clear cut thing from the patient standpoint, mm -hmm. should be done. Or after you look at that information to say, gosh, it shouldn't have been done no matter what. Or were, again, some of those patients in whom patients sort of thought it was a good thing and we sort of thought it was a good thing and the, the family thought it was a good thing and so it was done. And so the most important piece of information is to study then the variability in that inappropriate group. Because the most important thing about appropriate use criteria is that it, they do not substitute for an informed decision-making process where the physician sits down with the patient and his or her family explains the risks mm -hmm. and the benefits so that the patient can understand it and their family can understand it and then make the best decision about the procedure that they, the patient, are going to have. And so that's the most important thing. They do not these appropriate use criteria substitute for that. Now with that as a framework then, you can imagine this could be used in a wide variety of settings. For example, you could apply that in the setting of choosing an imaging test. Mm -hmm. Somebody, somebody comes in, they have chest discomfort, you try to decide whether they should have an echo or a regular treadmill exercise test or a nuclear stress test. You could then develop criteria to say which test should be used that the evidence supports. Or you could identify a scenario where you said, gee, we don't need to do any test at all. What's an appropriate to do a test or not to do a test? And so appropriate use criteria as guidelines, mm -hmm. just suggested guidelines based upon as much evidence as we have, can then be used across different aspects of the scenario of cardiovascular disease, both in terms of the diagnostic approach as well as the therapeutic approach. It's a very important tool. It has to be understand, and we have to understand it well and understand some of the granularity. It's not an easy thing. Well, that was something I wanted to ask you about. Is there, are there other areas of cardiovascular medicine where appropriate use in these registries can be used together to help improve outcomes and performance? Absolutely. We've talked a little bit about the imaging. Yeah. It clearly can do that. We talked about some of the other issues, or we could talk about some of the issues of heart failure. Mm -hmm. For example, at what point in time in heart failure, in that group of patients, are you going to put in a device that could be used for dual chamber pacing or for cardiac resynchronization therapy? And it's been studied in that. And so what it again does is to identify what the landscape looks like in terms of what is being performed, and then allows you to identify, number one, variability, and decide whether it's variability because some people are tall, some people are short. Mm -hmm. Some people are heavy set, some people aren't heavy set. Whether it's variability in that, or whether it's variability in interpretation of guidelines, or whether it's variability in patient and family expectations. We have to then use this, having identified the variability, study it, find out whether there are ways, systematic ways, to either make the variability less or maybe extend the indications for these procedures. Maybe some of the variability is because an expert physician talking with the patient says this is a really good thing. Mm -hmm. It's done, the patient does well. The guidelines then look at that piece of information and say, well, maybe we should change the guidelines. Maybe they're not set in stone, set in concrete because science changes. Yeah, so really the guidelines aren't dictating the science. The physician and his patients or her patients are really dictating what this framework should be. Correct. And it is that whole relationship between physician, patient, and family 
where the risk-benefit ratio of any strategy, whether that be a diagnostic strategy or a therapeutic strategy, it is that, that is the crucial relationship for the physicians to understand and for the patients and their families to understand because everything has some risk to it and many things have some benefit. Mm -hmm. Nothing is perfect. What an important conversation. Dr. David Holmes, thank you for being here. Great to be here. Really appreciate it. That's it for this edition of the ACC Update for August. Continue watching Cardiosource.org for all the latest news from your college. I'm Lisa Fletcher. Thanks for watching.